I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. In January, James Aitken told me, it doesn't matter what you think about ESG, the clamor will only increase, fund flows will accelerate, and we need to set our cynicism aside and be mindful of the consequences. It's going to be with us for a long time to come. Ever since, I've grown increasingly curious about the megatrend of sustainable investing. Climate change dominated the discussion at Davos a few weeks after, and social issues about the treatment of workers are front and center since the onset of COVID-19. This miniseries, Sustainable Investing, The Next Frontier, is my effort to learn alongside you through conversations with serious, passionate practitioners in the field. For the next month, you'll hear conversations twice a week in a familiar style and format, all focused on this important investment area. My guest on the fifth episode of Sustainable Investing, The Next Frontier, is David Blood, a co-founder and senior partner of Generation Investment Management, a pioneering sustainable investing firm he started with seven partners in 2004, including Vice President Al Gore. Our conversation covers the importance of culture in organizations, building businesses at Goldman Sachs, and David's fortuitous introduction to Al Gore. We turn to Generation's investment philosophy, principles, and investment process, including its focus on desirable industries, great businesses, and integration of ESG factors in research. We close by looking out at the next five to 10 years and addressing the urgency of the initiatives to improve the climate and social injustice. I recently got involved with the Alliance for Decision Education, an educational nonprofit dedicated to the belief that better decisions lead to better lives and a better society. The Alliance is building a national movement to ensure decision education is part of every middle and high school student's learning experience. I wish I had learned the science of decision making back then, and I'm keen to spread the word and do my part so that my kids and yours learn to make better decisions throughout their lives. To learn more and join me in this movement, visit allianceforddecisioneducation.org. That's allianceforddecisioneducation.org. Please enjoy my conversation with David Blood in this fifth episode of Sustainable Investing, The Next Frontier. David, nice to see you and thanks for doing this. Well, thank you, Ted. Thanks for having us. Why don't we just start with your background, really, at the beginning of the business? Well, I grew up in Michigan in Brazil, and I have to confess, when I was growing up, I never thought I would be in finance or investing. My mom was a teacher, and most of the role models I had growing up were either teachers or coaches. And I went to a small school in upstate New York called Hamilton College with the idea of being a teacher or a coach, or actually, ironically, a forest ranger was the other thing I was interested in. And in my sophomore year at Hamilton, they discontinued the education department. And so I had to look around to find a different degree. And I chose child psychology because that was the closest thing to education that I could find. And in hindsight, uh, child psychology was a perfect degree to manage investment bankers and investment managers. So it it turned out just fine. (laughs) And I got towards graduation and didn't have a job. I had applied to the Peace Corps and I'd been rejected. I applied to the University of Michigan to get my doctorate in psychology and I'd been rejected. And my dad said, you know, you've got to get a job. You've got to do something. And he said, you should apply to banks. This was in uh, early 1981, spring of 1981. He said, they might hire people like you, whatever that meant. And I applied to uh, 70 banks in the United States and was rejected by 69 of them, but ultimately (laughs) got one job at Bankers Trust Company in New York to go into finance. And I found out that I was uh, pretty good with numbers, actually, as it turns out, and then went from uh, Bankers Trust to business school and then to Goldman Sachs. 
my experience between my first and second year at business school really was uh, quite, I think, illustrative and, and instrumental in helping us think about studying a firm like Generation. I worked in corporate finance at a firm called E.F. Hutton. And at E.F. Hutton, I had really a, a really pretty terrible experience, to be honest with you. I was working from six in the morning to midnight. There really was no sense of teamwork in the organization. I had no idea what I was really doing. I didn't actually see a client until my third to last day of the summer. And I became quite disillusioned. And I thought, really, you know, actually, maybe finance isn't for me. Certainly, investment banking wasn't going to be for me. So I went back to school and spent most of September, October thinking about it. And I then had this sort of, uh, I guess, epiphany and said to myself, well, wait a minute, what if I chose the wrong firm? What if actually I like finance and I just went to the wrong organization? So this was in the autumn of 1984. I had this idea because culture was always important to me and how people worked and teamwork. And I thought, well, why don't I do a analysis of all the cultures of the, the major investment banks in the United States? And it was easy to do at business school because you had lots of colleagues who had worked in different places for the summer. You had all the, the firms coming up to do cocktail parties and introduce themselves. So you had a very easy time of assessing people and culture. So I did this analysis of all the culture of the major investment banks and ultimately concluded that the culture that would be most aligned for me was Goldman Sachs because it's business principles, it's commitment to integrity, it's commitment to clients, it's commitment to teamwork, meritocracy, all the things that I felt very, very strongly about. And I was lucky enough to get an offer at Goldman Sachs and went to Goldman Sachs. But I tell the story for two reasons, actually. One is it gives you a sense of why I thought working at Goldman Sachs was going to be the right place for me. And I was very blessed. It was a great experience. But secondly, the experience of understanding the culture of all those investment banks in the mid 80s turned out to be a great indicator of success of those organizations. Turns out that since I've been in finance now 35 years, there have been, I think, probably 10, 15 major organizations that have gone bankrupt. And they've mostly gone out of business for failures of culture and business principles. And it was ultimately not a surprise to me that Drexel went out of business. It wasn't a surprise to me that Solomon Brothers had the challenges that they had. Same for Kidder Peabody, et cetera, et cetera. And so what I began to realize is that, that understanding companies and understanding management teams, you could get a sense of whether they would be successful or not, dependent upon how they treated their people, their compensation structures, their leadership structures, their governance structures. And those lessons, for me anyway, were critical learnings as we began to think about setting up a firm like Generation. So your path at Goldman, what part of the bank did you end up working in and spending your time? Well, I ended up working in just about every division of Goldman Sachs. The only one I didn't work in was research. And I actually had kind of an unusual career. I was involved in actually helping to set up businesses. So in my career at Goldman Sachs, I worked on four major new business initiatives over the 18 years that I was there. I worked first in investment banking and capital markets, growing a private capital markets business. I was involved in when Goldman Sachs began to truly expand outside of the United States and really began to ramp up its trading businesses. They brought John Thane in to run the finance business. They brought David Vinier in. They brought myself in and a handful of others to help augment the control and treasury businesses of Goldman Sachs. And so I spent a number of years in that side of the business. I was actually asked in 1996 to consider whether Goldman Sachs should set up an online discount broker, which we ultimately concluded was a bad idea which I guess maybe today they're, they're re-examining, <laughs> but we'll, we'll see about that. But certainly in 1996, it didn't seem like a very good idea to me anyway. And then I was uh, very fortunate to 
be asked to help build uh, Goldman Sachs Asset Management in 1996 and have spent the rest of my career in the asset management business. But when I think about my skill set, I actually, first of all, I think of myself ultimately as a debt guy because that was my early career at Bankers Trust and the debt capital markets business. But I really think of myself as having have had an opportunity to help build businesses. And that's continued at Generation. I have helped found some not-for-profit businesses, social finance being among them. And then more recently, On the Edge Conservation is another business that I'm helping to start. So I kind of think of myself as someone who knows a little bit about how to build businesses as opposed to being an expert in investment management or investment banking or anything like that. Yeah. So you have this experience at Goldman Sachs, and then you take the natural path of many who have had success at Goldman Sachs, and you retire. Yes. Apparently, that's what you must do. (laughs) (laughs) So what happened in between the retirement and the formation of Generation? How did that all play out? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I was very committed to Goldman Sachs and its business principles and culture. And I was one of the partners who voted to stay private in 1999, actually originally 1998, but Goldman Sachs went public in 1999. And I thought it was going to be close, and I obviously was quite wrong about that. I was concerned that the culture of the firm was going to change and that it would evolve, and it probably was going to change anyway. I probably was very naive in retrospect. But at that point, I had a a sense that my career at Goldman Sachs was going to be limited going forward. So I I was in a fortunate position to be running the asset management business, actually co-heading the business at the time. I felt I had a very clear commitment to our clients, my colleagues. And I said, well, I'm just going to do the best I can for five years or so. And as we got to the 2003 period, I realized that it was probably time for me to go do something different. But along the way, it's going back to the early story of my uh, summer associate experience, we had begun to talk about sustainability at Goldman Sachs Asset Management. This was at the time of some of the, the terrible corporate crises, Enron, WorldCom, et cetera, and governance corporate governance became really quite important. Hank Paulson at the time was quite interested in it. We began to think about that. And actually, one of my colleagues, Mark Ferguson, one of the co-founders, he and I spent a lot of time thinking about that. He also was the person who introduced me specifically to sustainable investing. And I began to think, well, you know what, perhaps we should do something like that or bring sustainability into Goldman Sachs Asset Management. And then I realized, no, that was going to be pretty hard. Goldman Sachs Asset Management was 1,400 people, something like that. There were 10 different strategies. It was early in terms of people thinking about sustainability in the ESG. And it was at that point I thought, you know what, the best thing to do would be to retire and go set up a small boutique. And I spoke to Goldman Sachs about it. They knew what we were going to do. And actually, when I told my partners I was going to retire to set up a a sustainable investing firm, I think they probably thought I really had lost my marbles (laughs) once and for (laughs) all. My boss at the time was Phil Murphy, who is the current governor of the state of New Jersey. And Phil had been approached by Al Gore about Goldman Sachs representing Gore in acquiring a company called Sustainable Asset Management. And it was a very small acquisition. I think it would have been $35 million or something like that, an acquisition that Goldman Sachs wasn't going to do. And Murphy phoned me up and said, look, you are supposed to know something about asset management. You now claim your interest in sustainability. Would you do me a favor and go to Boston to meet Vice President Gore and and try to help him? At least Goldman Sachs can say they're trying to help And so I brought the business plan that I had been developing with Mark Ferguson and one of our other co-founders, Colin LeDuc, and I brought the business plan to Boston to meet with Al, not because I wanted him to be our partner, but because it was a good example of how you build a company or buy a company. And as we spoke that day, we realized that we were trying to do the same thing and that perhaps we should partner together. And ultimately, there were seven of us that founded Generation. Peter Knight, one of his colleagues, Miguel Nogales, who was a good friend of Mark's, and then another colleague from Goldman Sachs, Peter Harris. And we were the seven founders. But the day that I met Al, two really important notions that have driven the founding of Generation kind of came to light. The first one was my interest has always been in poverty and social justice. And Al's has been in climate 
And yeah. obviously I, I care about the climate as well. But what we realized at that day is that the question about climate change and the question of poverty, they were basically the same coin, but different sides. And that from that point on, we always wanted to ensure that we integrated all aspects of sustainability into how we were talking about sustainability. And secondly, we recognized that if we could bring together finance skills, business skills, coupled with sustainability skills, public policy skills, and truly integrate that thinking into one philosophy, we could create some really interesting insights about business and about investing. And that's how we've developed our firm over these many years now. And what was that genesis of the philosophy that you created at Generation? Well, it was a two-year journey. (laughs) The truth is we started talking about it in September, October of 2003, and we took third-party money in October of 2005. And along the way, we spent many hours, the seven founders, and then there ultimately there were 16 of us who, who established the firm. Interestingly, a third of the 12 or 16 people came from sustainability backgrounds, and the other two-thirds came from traditional investing backgrounds. And we felt that this would be the right mix to develop the insights that we thought were going to be important to manage capital as we went forward. And we had a philosophy that really a framework that we've we've kept to from the very beginning. We've obviously developed it, continued to learn from it, but the philosophy is based on three premises. The first, long-term investing is best practice. Secondly, that sustainability is a current and future driver of economies. Again, sustainability broadly defined to include issues like climate, the environment, biodiversity, health, poverty, social justice, water challenges, et cetera, et cetera. And then thirdly, environmental and social governance factors were tools integrated into a traditional investment process to help us understand the quality of the business and the quality of management, what a company does and how a company does it. And we've always felt that this investment framework, and this is true for how we manage our public equities, our private equity, it's been about understanding or developing differentiated insights to deploy capital with the objective of delivering significant and superior risk-adjusted investment results. We have never thought about this as trading values for value. And that, Ted, is the most important thing I can say and reiterate is that for so long, people have thought about sustainability and ESG as not serious investing, not serious business. And it's always about a trade-off about values and you're going to ultimately have poor investment results. Well, we may have poor investment results, but the framework is superior. There's no question about that. And uh, we've been fortunate to be at this now for 15 plus years. The track record has been, of course, we've had a fair amount of good luck along the ways, but the track record has demonstrated significant skill and confidence in this investment framework over these years. What sort of framework or lens have you thought of in terms of like, what does sustainable mean in terms of businesses you're investing in and capital markets? Sustainability is probably people will have their own definition. And in fact, sometimes I think the big challenges that we've had in mainstreaming sustainability and ESG is that there are multiple definitions. There are multiple titles for this type of investing, socially responsible investing, responsible investing, impact investing, sustainable investing. But ultimately, what we're talking about are businesses that are run for the long term and that are trying to meet real needs of consumers and society, that we ultimately will drive to a clean, fair, healthy, safe, no carbon society, a resilient society. We think this will ultimately be better economics, better businesses, and clearly better for the planet and for people. What does your team and the sort of suite of activities that you have at Generation look like today, now 15 years later? It's interesting, as I was thinking about the opportunity to speak with you today, I realized first, most folks think about Generation as a firm that was established to promote sustainability and ESG, and we're known as a sustainable asset management firm, a green firm, et cetera. And I think we have been helpful and important in helping to mainstream sustainability. And I think our critical insight 
was that if you integrated sustainability and ESG into a rigorous investment process, you could develop differentiated insights. And that that was an investment framework, particularly coupled with a long-term orientation to deliver superior risk-adjusted results. But we also tried to do three other things when we founded the firm in 2004 that I think are quite relevant to a lot of the subjects that you talk about on your podcast. The first is we wanted to build a really interesting firm. And having had the opportunity to run a a pretty big asset management firm, we kind of knew what we wanted to be. And so we were very deliberate to develop a focused boutique partnership We wanted to be mission-driven. The culture was important. We are a research-driven firm. Everybody on the investment side does research, including Mark and Miguel as the co-chief investment officers. And we believe very strongly in high conviction, concentrated portfolios. We also wanted to take a new approach to clients. We decided from the very beginning that we would cap our global equity fund. We would cap all of our strategies because we learned that sometimes firms get too big and that the capacity should be constrained, actually. And we wanted to ensure that our fee structures were very aligned with clients. We knew that oftentimes asset managers would prioritize growth of assets under management versus limiting their assets under management. And so what we did is we... We developed an economic model that was based on a three-year rolling performance fee that would really ensure that every decision we took would be around optimizing for alpha as opposed to asset center management. And so very specifically, since we founded the firm in 2004, almost to the penny, every dollar that we've earned in performance fee has been our profit. We've not had profits based on assets under management. It was deliberately designed so that if our clients did well, we would do well. If our clients didn't do well, then that would be bad luck for us. And so client alignment was a critical part of how we founded the firm. And then lastly, we always knew that mission mattered, that culture mattered. And so we wanted to develop a organization that had a sense of purpose from the very beginning. So Generation is a commercial business for sure, but it's also a mission-driven organization. 5% of our profits are allocated to the Generation Foundation. Advocacy is critical to why we exist, advocating for sustainable investing, sustainable capitalism. And it's the combination of mission, we're a B Corp, the combination of mission and a drive to be excellent that I think creates a really unique business model. And what's, I think, fun about what we do and critical is that it's self-reinforcing. We're a mission-driven firm. We want to promote sustainability and ESG in the capital markets. We won't be able to do that unless we deliver outstanding investment results. And so it ties together. So being mission-driven, you might say, well, then they're not serious investors. Well, actually, if we cannot deliver significant and consistent, strong investment results, We can do all the advocacy we want, but no one will listen because it'll be uninspiring. And so this business model is self-reinforcing and I think has helped us build a really robust business over the course of the last 15 years. But it's more than just these guys got in early to sustainability. We tried very hard to innovate on uh, not only sustainability, but how you build a firm, how you think about clients and how you think about purpose. At the end of the day, as you said, it really does come down to this business performance, and you've certainly been doing that. So let's talk a little bit about how you've gone about it, and particularly in the global equity product. So let's just start with the investment process, and where do you end up generating your ideas from? When we started our firm, we, of course, had a clean sheet of paper, and we were able to invest anywhere. And as I mentioned in the beginning, we spent really two years learning to work together and actually doing the work. And so what we we said to ourselves is, okay, let's first understand what is the context of business? What are the drivers of change? We began to think about the sustainability challenges that we've talked about, ranging from climate change to pandemics to challenges of inequality, poverty, and did a lot of work around those broader issues and continue to do a lot of work around those sorts of issues on a sort of a macro basis. And then we said, okay, given our thinking around the drivers of change, what are the types of companies 
What are the types of industries that we want to own given a drive to a more sustainable form of capitalism, sustainable economies? And so we began to do a series of what we call industry roadmaps, where we would do deep dive analyses of different industries to try to figure out whether they would be long-term robust industries as we evolve to a net zero economy. And we developed a series of hypotheses about industries. And then from that point, we said, okay, we like technology, although we look at technology in many different ways or, or certain types of healthcare businesses. Let's then drill into what are the best businesses in those industries and develop ultimately what we call our focus list, a list of, it's now I think about 125 companies that we're actively following and researching that subject to price we're prepared to invest in. And it's that list that is by far the most important decision at Generation. That's where all the research goes to have the debate around what companies go on our focus list. But it's driven by what are the businesses that we want to own, given the drivers of change that we see in economies. Are there certain sectors that you've found meet those criteria far more than others? Oftentimes, people have thought, well, sustainable investors, generation, all you're doing, you're excluding industries and you're negative screening. And we've never done that. We've always actually been positively defining what are the types of businesses we want to own. And that is a huge advantage that we have relative to a number of organizations we're concentrated. I, I know many people think concentrated is 20 to 25 stocks. We're sort of 40 to 50 stocks. And I can go into why we think that that's a better approach. But in any event, we're concentrated. We don't have to own anything. We can own what we want. We're bottoms up stock pickers. And so we're trying to find businesses that we think will be robust and resilient over a period of time. Now, there are industries that we'll add no value to or that we think are not particularly robust over time. So, for example, we have not owned energy businesses for a decade. We've not owned hydrocarbon businesses because we don't think they're priced properly. They haven't really priced the fact of climate change, and we think they have a significant stranded asset risk. And so we just don't think that that's – we have some views on whether it's a, ethically a good idea, but our decision to not invest in hydrocarbons was purely economic. We think they're not great businesses. Now, the businesses that we have enjoyed investing in are – Healthcare businesses that are really, I guess the expression would be picks and shovels, basically businesses that are providing services or sort of unique capabilities to the healthcare industry. Same for technology, same often for the industrial businesses, the consumer businesses we've owned over the years. Now, that's not always true. We've owned Microsoft, for example. We've owned some very large businesses. We tend to own some large businesses because we think they have robust business models. They are clearly trying to be part of the solution, and they ultimately deliver what we think are pretty interesting risk-adjusted results. So when you're building that focus list, how are you integrating these kind of commonly thought of as ESG or sustainable factors into your research process? Well, it's sustainability and ESG help us define the quality of business and quality of management. So everything we do has a component of sustainability and ESG in it. Now, sometimes we will call sustainability out specifically, or more often than not, it will be implied. It'll be embedded into how we think about a type of business or a management team. And frankly, this is an insight that we've developed over time, first of all, it's not a checkbox exercise. So the extent that organizations are looking to bring in sort of sustainability or ESG research and that they run their screens based only on the checklist, we think those experiences will be less robust because sustainability and ESG often are nuanced and there's trade-offs and there's subtleties. And that's the second point is that you have to think of these questions holistically. You have to think about which issues matter to the industry or the company you're talking about. It's not one size fits all. You have to be very, very holistic in understanding those businesses. And then you have to be prepared to be wrong. You have to be prepared to continue to iterate and understand the types of 
issues that are driving the success of those companies and businesses. So for example, and I think my partners hate it when I say this, but we were investors in Facebook early on. And we ultimately decided that how they were treating information and how they were dealing with some of their challenges, which they still have, was unsatisfactory to how we were thinking about sustainability. And so sustainability in ESG is not black and white. It's really gray often. And the difference in, we think, in terms of developing risk models, as well as the ability to choose great businesses that will be successful as we transition to a more sustainable economy is to recognize that things are going to change and evolve over this period of time. And we have to recognize that there will be trade-offs and and in certain cases, steps forward, steps backwards, and then managing that discussion over time. And the fact that we're having the discussion is what I think allows us to make good investment decisions. If an investor isn't recognizing that these issues matter to the success of business, whether it be sustainability issues or ESG issues, that's where investors are making a mistake. They fundamentally matter. That's why they should be integrated into investment processes. As you're going through research on, say, one of the companies on the focus list or something that's on the bubble of the focus list, how do you think about measuring or assessing when there's a business that kind of conflicts on different factors? So maybe they're making good strides on the environmental side, but they have some issues with worker safety or something like that. It is something that we're wrestling with all the time. What we thought about in 2005 is different than what we're thinking about in 2020. What we thought about even a couple of years ago, it continues to evolve. The urgency of those trade-offs and the learnings around those trade-offs continue to evolve as well. The critical insight that we've had over these years is sometimes there's clear lines. There are certain businesses that there's just no chance we would ever invest in them. Their sustainability criteria or their ESG thinking is just so terrible, we wouldn't even consider it. But there's not that many. <laughs> there are quite a few businesses that are potentially good businesses that can have positive impact. And I want to come back at the impact here in a second, but that there are trade-offs and understanding and weighing those trade-offs and learning from the mistakes you make is critical to being a sustainable ESG investor. And that's, again, as sustainability and ESG goes mainstream, and, and we believe it is already mainstream, but it certainly will become mainstream over the course of the next couple of years. It is really critical that the rigor of sustainability and ESG is enhanced and that people continue to learn and that they don't revert back to sort of a checklist or a checkbox exercise and that we kind of develop these indices and it's either a bad company or a good company based on a specific approach. That will be a mistake because, as I said, there are clear violators of sustainability and ESG, but very often what makes a good company versus a great company is based on nuance and understanding the holistic situation of the business. And do you have a particular preference for businesses that you feel are already doing a good job on these metrics compared to those that may not have historically, but clearly are improving? As I mentioned earlier, Generation wanted to be a boutique. We are a focus firm. We basically do global equity, Asia equity, growth equity, and long-term equity. So we determined that we would assess quality. And we want to be a high quality manager. So we will invest in high quality businesses, high quality management teams. We know very well that another approach could be to find companies that are less good and work to make them better or find businesses that management teams that are in transition, value oriented, if you will, to use that analogy. And we concluded that that's a good idea. And we know some firms who are doing it and they're doing it actually quite well, but that's not us. We are trying to buy great businesses and great management teams with a margin of safety, which I know you would say, well, I've heard that about a thousand million times, but that's what we're really trying to do. And we leave the other strategies for those who can do it better than we can. What's the balance in your research process between studying these sustainable factors and maybe more traditional financial and business assessment outside of those factors? When I talk about drivers of change and sustainability, people often will then think we're sort of a top-down manager. 
And we truly are not. We believe that sustainability is a driver of economies and we have to understand that. But we're bottoms up stock pickers. And so if you sit in on our investment meetings that Mark and Miguel run, they're basically as you would see in any bottoms up stock picking organization. It's about understanding how businesses operate, how management teams are operating. We just have a larger list of things that we think are relevant to the success of business that we're integrating and reviewing in our assessment of those businesses. And incidentally, to get on our focus list, it takes months. And our approach to investing has always been, let's really understand businesses really, really well. Let's invest in a small number that we think are attractively priced, but let's be ready to buy others when market prices change. And so if it's on our focus list and we don't own it, we're covering it as if we own it because we think we'll get the opportunity to do so. To go from the 125 or so on the focus list to the 40 to 50 in the portfolio, how does that decision get made? Ultimately, that's the decision for Mark and Miguel. Mark and Miguel cannot buy something unless it's on the focus list. And the focus list is voted on by the entire global equity team. We wouldn't necessarily call it, it has to be unanimous, but we clearly try to, to ensure that the votes are equally based, if you will. So we actually have a rock, paper, scissor system of, of voting so that everybody votes at the same time. And we're very f- focused on biases and ensuring that we give everybody a voice in how we're thinking about investing. But ultimately, while we're very team-driven, ultimately, Mark and Miguel have the X on their heads to deliver strong investment results, and they have done so. What is it about 40 to 50 names in the construction of the portfolio you alluded to earlier? The statisticians among us will tell you that you can diversify, you'd have a perfectly well-diversified portfolio at sort of 20 to 25 stocks. And I know the math and that's true. And we tend to find that our 10 biggest positions can be a sort of 40 to 50% of our portfolio. But we do like the tail, if you will. It helps us think about how we might deploy and raise up positions as we go forward. And so having a bit of a tail of businesses makes sense. Plus, there are some businesses that we would like to own that are either smaller or are in more risky areas. And so from a risk management perspective, it makes sense to have a smaller position. But ultimately, we've wanted to invest with our conviction. And that's about concentration. And we know that concentrated portfolios are best practice investing. What does portfolio turnover look like? Well, we very clearly talk about being long-term and our portfolios will turn over sort of once every two or three years. Now, people would say that doesn't seem very long-term at all (laughs) compared to some long-term investors. And we would say, yeah, fair enough, except that there's two other factors that we think about. One is uh, we are very price-driven. And so Our turnover sometimes is driven by adjusting to price. And secondly, the real question for us is what's the turnover of our focus list? That's 125 companies that we're actively covering, and that's more like 10%. So we are truly trying to find great businesses and own them for a long period of time, forever, if possible, but it's typically not possible. A lot of times people in the space, you know, once you own these positions or once you're covering them carefully on the focus list, you think about working with the companies and engaging with them to try to improve. I'm curious where you stand on that, given that you're already trying to find businesses that are executing effectively across holistically. We have a very strong conviction that engagement, voting our proxies, engaging with management is our fiduciary duty. And we are very passionate about that. We have historically done that with our analysts. We've recently hired a man by the name of Edward Mason from the church commissioners here in the United Kingdom. Ed will be joining us. And we really want to even ramp that up. So yes, great businesses, great management teams, they can all still be pushed to do better. And we tend to try to do things behind closed doors. We're not activists, although we will be an activist if we have to be. But we think engaging with management on things that we know a little bit about, like sustainability, like governance, like a capital allocation, like remuneration structures, is our responsibility. And everybody at Generation, all of our analysts have that responsibility. We're not outsourcing that. That's for us. 
I'm curious what that example would be where you would be an activist, because as you walk through this, it's I would think that, you know, if a management team wasn't implementing on the things that are important to you, they shouldn't be on the focus list. We often own these businesses for a long time. We know these management teams for a long time and we're working with them. There can be a point where they have not really taken our advice and and we don't know everything. And so sometimes it makes sense not to take our advice, but there are certain factors that, for example, a remuneration structure, where if we ultimately are uncomfortable with it, we will say so. And there have been instances where we've had to say so publicly. There may be instances, particularly as relates to climate change, as we go forward over the next five to 10 years. Now, most of our businesses have very, very small carbon footprints, but they may be able to do more. And we need to be prepared to be clear about actions that we expect our organizations to take, the companies we're investing in. I think the most important thing to say is if there is a violation of what we think is right from a sustainability or ESG perspective, we will sell that stock and it will go off the focus list. And that has happened. Facebook is an example of it. But on balance, as I said earlier, uh, there are very few companies that are perfect. There are very few people that are perfect. And so we need to work within the, the shades of gray and work to make all of us better. And And I'll talk about the urgency of the challenges here in a minute. But I think you could expect that Generation will be more active and more engaged with management teams as we go forward because we're running out of time. Why don't you go ahead and talk about that? The whole question about sustainability and ESG really drives down to a a couple of points. The first is the notion that all investing has impact. Today, we're learning or we're hearing a lot about impact investing, and sometimes we get confused by that, frankly, because we know that all business has impact and therefore all capital allocation has an impact. The question is, are you measuring it? Are you reporting on it? Are you trying, as we were just saying, to have more positive impact? as we go forward. And we think actually, as time goes on, and by time we mean a couple of years, not decades, that all investors, all asset owners will be required, will require of us, and probably their own stakeholders will require that their investment performance be based upon risk, return, and impact. Impact being a critical component of allocation of capital as we go forward, whether that be to address the challenges of climate, the challenges of the just transition, or indeed both because they're interlinked. We think the next five to 10 years will be the most important years of our career. The challenges to meet the sustainable development goals, the challenges to meet a net zero are extraordinary. And now coming off the terrible tragedy of this pandemic and the human health and environmental health are clearly linked. The lessons learned from this tragedy are clear about early action, about managing the challenges. The scientists have been telling us for years the challenges of climate. Scientists were telling us about the challenges of pandemics. We need to act in advance, and we don't have much time to do that. And capitalism and capital markets and investors will be critical in making this transition. And this transition isn't sort of incremental. It is transformational. Whole industry, and this is a great opportunity for investors. We think that the transformation to net zero will be the most important economic transition in history. And therefore, investors run significant risk as well as have significant opportunity if they manage this transition, this transformation very well. All investment decisions need to take climate and a just transition into consideration as we allocate capital over the course of the next five to 10 years. How do you? broaden your impact beyond the substantial capital, but in the scheme of things, small impact you can have with your own capital. I know you've mentioned some of these organizations you're involved with, but how do you collaborate with other investors to make this movement and transition happen in an expedient way? It's a critical question that we've been wrestling with as an organization over the last couple of years. And our clients, our stakeholders, and most importantly, our employees and partners will insist that Generation do more than just manage assets well for our clients. That's one of the reasons why we hired a head of communications. That's one of the reasons why we've hired Ed. We want to do more in terms of 
of communicating and working and sharing the lessons we've learned over the last five to 10 years. We also have allocated an additional 5% of our profits this past year to develop other impact strategies. We will collaborate with anybody, whether it be on natural climate solutions, whether it be on climate first oriented investments, investments that are, that are sort of catalytic, if you will. We are going to look to leverage our experiences over the next five years to hopefully help make a difference. And it's, as I said in the very beginning, Generation is an investment firm through and through. We want to deliver outstanding investment results, but we're also a mission-driven firm. And the mission to address the challenges of climate as well as poverty and inequality are so critical now. And the opportunity to help make a difference and capital can make a difference. We're all in on this, Ted. We are all in on this. Where do you see some of the pushback? Because as I listen to it, it feels so obvious, and it does more and more to people these days. But where's the pushback that you see from a strong wave of momentum just continuing? There's still a sense that sustainability and ESG is not serious. I uh, often smile, uh, particularly in the early days when we would go in, particularly in America, we'd go in and talk about sustainability and ESG. And I could just imagine the folks that sitting across the table were just sort of thinking, you know what, these guys must go into a room, hold hands, sing Kumbaya, and that's how they make their investment decisions. And actually, that is how we do it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make is that there still is a sense that sustainability or ESG is about negative screening and it's about trading values for value. It isn't. It's a rigorous, robust investment framework, business framework. That's why the Business Roundtable, that's why the World Economic Forum, these organizations, the British Academy, they recognize that multi-stakeholders is best practice business. And we have to make people realize this is a business question. This is an economic question. This isn't a political question. This is about how do you drive to a better, resilient, robust economy? And that's what we have to keep making. That's why we've always felt that coming from investment backgrounds, we have a responsibility to always make the business case. We have strong views from an ethics and morals perspective, and we can make that case. But we've always felt very strongly we have to make the business case about investing sustainably because that's clear. It's robust and it really will move the needle. At the onset, you mentioned that you're taking 5% of the profits and putting into the Generation Foundation. And I'm curious, what types of activities do you find appropriate to do in a philanthropic sense that may be different from how it makes sense from a pure kind of capitalistic sense in moving the ball forward? Well, so our philanthropic activities have been mostly research related. So we have been investing in organizations, initiatives that are researching around sustainability or climate change or a just transition. And so it's not really been capital allocated. Now, the additional 5% that we've allocated in 2019 that we're spending now, that might actually go into businesses that aren't currently commercial that we think can be transformational and catalytic to the transition to net zero or, or a just transition. So that will be more investment oriented, but our foundation is, is really about sustainability research and then action around that research. I'm really curious to ask, within your portfolio over the years, is there an example of a company that you've owned, maybe it's on the focus that you've owned for a long time, that most people on the outside wouldn't instinctively think, oh, that's something that you know, the pioneer and sustainable investing firm would own? One firm that people, I think, don't know very well, actually, is a firm called Henry Schein. And Henry Schein is a distributor of healthcare, dentistry, and veterinarian products to dentists, to doctors, to, to vets. And they're run by an extraordinary management team who is committed to the long term, committed to culture, committed to values, committed to community. And frankly, the, how they behaved and demonstrated their the strength of their business model and their conviction during this crisis has been extraordinary. And so people say, well, what is a distributor? How is that a sustainable business? What's green about that? Well, it's actually a really well-run business that runs itself for the long term that takes multiple stakeholder views into how they operate. 
And I'll tell you, we've looked at many companies in our portfolio have reacted extraordinarily well with great responsibility, great integrity throughout this crisis. And that's true for our private portfolio, too. We haven't talked much about our private portfolios, but we have been very actively engaged with both our public and private companies over the course of the last couple of months to ensure that they will operate with the same integrity and responsibility and commitment to sustainability that they always have. And we're pleased to say they are. As we come out of this crisis, hopefully sooner rather than later, there's a lot that's likely to change about capitalism as we knew it before not too long ago. Think about the efficiency of supply chains, whether it's remote work or different modes of work and the need for human capital. And I'm wondering how you're starting to think about the potential trade-offs in optimizing profitability and these situations where the differences are likely to mean, let's just say, a higher cost structure to do the same type of business in a better way? It is a question that we've been wrestling with for some time. And I, I think the first thing to say is always important to think about a business model over the long term. And if you don't, then those questions can be very difficult to answer sometimes. They can be very black and white. But if you begin to think about, well, what's in the best long-term interest of a business, a private business, a family-owned business, in a public company, is it better to not furlough your people and keep them over the course of a crisis and spend more money than you would have otherwise, but build the loyalty of those people and those communities over the coming five to 10 years, I think absolutely it's a no-brainer. But you only think about that on a long-term basis. Do you think it's a great idea to change your, your manufacturing processes so you can deliver personal protective equipment for our healthcare professionals and potentially have sunk costs in your manufacturing facilities because you've ramped up for that? Yeah, I think it's a great idea. But if you're just gonna look at it over the course of 2020, probably not. But over a long term, easy. But to your point, there is no question that as we come out of the pandemic and we begin to reflate our economies, this is a once in a century opportunity to rethink the relationship between capital, between business, between civil society and government. And we might need to think of a, of a longer term philosophy and framework on how we, we manage those trade-offs and think about those trade-offs over time. And I think, frankly, we will, and that we will have a more sustainable form of capitalism over the course of the next 10 to 20 years than we've had over the last 10 to 20 years. Well, David, I want to leave a little time to turn to some closing questions. So what's your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? It is definitely sports. If I read a newspaper, I turn to the sports section first. I love all sports, team sports. I grew up in Michigan. I'm a Tigers fan. I'm a Red Wings fan. I'm a Packers fan. And because of my friend, Mr. Ferguson, I'm a Manchester United fan. <laughs> and so how have you been filling that gap when the newspapers have no live sports to speak of? It's been terrible. <laughs> and all I can tell you is my family thinks it's a good thing. They're not looking forward to uh, athletics coming back on TV. Oh, I hear you there. What's your biggest pet peeve? I think people who are late. I learned that at Goldman Sachs. I feel like if you are meant to turn up at a meeting at two, you ought to turn up at five to two. And when you turn up at a quarter after, you've kind of kept a lot of folks waiting, and that's not very polite. What's your biggest investment pet peeve? Well, we talked about it. Folks who think that sustainability and ESG is about trading values for value, and we don't. We fundamentally think that the business case is clear, it's robust, and uh, we feel very passionate about making that case. What do you do for self-growth? I uh, try to learn from my mistakes. I think that is a um, critical cultural point at Generation. Our investment teams are always talking about what they could do different and better. Investing is really hard. If you are a great investor, you get it right about 55 to 60 percent of the time, which means you're wrong 40 percent of the time. I'm wrong much more than 40 percent of the time. And so learning from those mistakes, I think by far is the, the best thing you can do as a business professional and uh, investment professional and indeed as a person. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? Well, integrity for sure. And I think resiliency. Uh, my mom used to say uh, stick to itness. 
and I've always felt that quitting is just not one of the things you, you do. If you get knocked down, you get back up and there's going to be setbacks. And the folks who I think are most successful over time are the folks who can get back up. And that's true in the investment business too. You don't always outperform, as you know, and it's learning from those challenges and then building back from those challenges. All right. Last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in your life? Definitely controlling my emotions. My younger self, I was too quick to show, uh, unfortunately, I have a little bit of a temper. I was too quick to show that temper. Leaders need to be in control. Sometimes leaders should express happiness and express frustration, but mostly you should be in control because when you're not, you're not your best self. And then you often spend a fair amount of time fixing the mistakes you make when you've you've lost your self-control a little bit. So self-control is definitely top of the list. Well, David, thanks so much for taking the time. Well, thank you so much for having us, Ted. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show, and I thank you for it. Have a good one, and see you next time. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. All opinions expressed by guests on this show are solely their own opinion and do not necessarily reflect those of their firm. A manager's appearance on the show does not constitute an endorsement or investment recommendation by TED or Capital Allocators.